Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Here in the state of Hawaii, we are impacted by the federal government perhaps more than any other state of the union. And so the people that we send to Washington, D.C. to represent us play an extremely important role. But sometimes we wonder, how well are they representing us? We have a rare opportunity now to fill a vacant seat in Congress. And I'd like to say at the outset how sad I am personally and how much I send my condolences to the family of the late Kmart Takai, who served Hawaii well. I had the privilege of knowing him since his youth at the University of Hawaii and saw his career. Uh, he has truly been a great servant for the people of Hawaii, and we extend our aloha to his family and to all who are close to him. What that means, however, for the rest of the state is that there is a vacant congressional seat, and there's the opportunity also to fill that seat into a full term. Right now running for that seat is Sherlene Ostrov a former colonel in the United States Army, a woman who has started her own business, and now somebody who is going to throw her hat into the rink as the Republican challenger for the seat. Let's welcome her to the program. Shirlene, aloha, and welcome to the program. Aloha, Kelly E. Colonel, I should say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, I'm delighted. Thanks. You know, I just want to tell you how proud we are that somebody is rising to the mantle <laughs> and taking on really a monumental task to run as the opposition party in a state that is largely one party. It is. It is. I'm, I'm proud to do it and I'm excited to represent uh, the alternative voice here in Hawaii. Well, that's something very important. And, and really, your run, uh, as I understand you, is not about partisanship. It's not it's that not. Republicans are better than Democrats or better than Libertarians. It's about the importance of having another voice. That's right. I think uh, it's key for us and any, any state to have a mm -hmm. vibrant two-party system. You know, as they say, iron sharpens iron. That's and, right. And in order for us to have the best ideas, um, we've got to keep each other on our toes, and, and, and the Republican voice is a very important voice that has to be represented in the national conversation. That's right, and you talk about national conversation. We, we have this interesting nexus of local and yes. national issues here in Hawaii, yes. probably more interesting than almost anywhere else in the country. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and, and uh, that's what I hope to do. You know, the national, the majority up in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. is a Republican That's party. That's right. And so Hawaii currently is not represented in that majority, and, and that's why I think it's important for Hawaii to have a second voice. So and you're suggesting as well that should you be elected, you'd be able to work with the Republicans that are in power, giving Hawaii more options than we currently have. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a very important actually to have that voice and to be able to have influence on both in both parties. Now here in Hawaii, uh, there's something that we're very sensitive about, and that's the importance of the military presence. Yes. Whether we go back to World War II and the bombing of Pearl Harbor, or look at the complexity of the world today, especially in the theater of the Indian Ocean, yes. uh, the Pacific Rim, and so forth, uh, Hawaii is a critical place for the nation's security and the military's presence here is very important for Hawaii. Yes. You, you actually come from a strong military background. Absolutely. In fact, in your background, you've had not only military experience as a colonel in the Army, you've also the been... Air Force. Air Force, yes. yes. yes oh, sir. Uh, sorry for the wrong <laughs> oh, no, there. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you also have had some dip diplomatic um, experience in working with Congress. Yes. What are your views on national security? So, I, I think you're exactly right. The main reason why I wanted to run is not because I wanted to, to be part of the majority party in mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., although that is critical. The reason is because I understand the challenges that, that we have ahead uh, in the national security arena. And Hawaii plays a very, very important role in the national security strategy of the country. If you look at the region of the Pacific, the main threats of the future uh, that's that's where they are and Hawaii can and will play a major role and so I believe Hawaii should have somebody who is very experienced and knowledgeable in the mm -hmm. national security uh, arena what to are lead the way. What are some of the major threats or at least one of the major threats that we're facing today in the world especially from our 
point of view here in Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, for our national security, we must remain focused on destroying ISIS. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, destroying ISIS. But the threats of the future are not so much far into the future. If you look at uh, China, for instance, China has been aggressive in building their military. That's right. And also building islands in the South China Sea um, with no challenge. That's right. And that very aggressive move should worry the United States. In fact, as you mentioned, China and shift our attention slightly from ISIS. Yes. It, it reminds me that we've had so much attention on the Middle East in, over the last decade yes. that we haven't really ob observed on a national level the extent to which Hawaii and the Pacific Command have been absolutely important in keeping peace in this vast region of the Pacific Rim. Absolutely. What are some of the other areas in the Pacific Rim that we need to well, be concerned about? Well, you know, if you, if you look at the North Korea yes. continues to be mm -hmm. menacing. Um, and even Russia, if you uh, read the paper uh, just this weekend, Russia has launched a new aircraft carrier in the region. I, and so these That's threats right. are alive and well, um, and, and we have to be able to address them. And many of them are not neatly compartmentalized as That's right. distant military threats. Take, That's for example, right. what goes on in the Philippines and its relationship yes. to drug trafficking. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so when you look at all of these challenges together, I think that the national security agenda is going to be prime in the Pacific. How would you advise the president? As a, that's one of the roles that Congress yes. and the Senate play. How, how would you speak to the national role of the, uh, or the United States role in the world in terms of security? That's a great question. I think that the United States has a leadership role in this world and mm -hmm. should be the leader in the Pacific. And they are. And so if I were to talk to the president, I would make sure that the, that the strategy includes a mix of diplomatic and military mm -hmm. uh, strategies uh, to engage our allies and to make sure that those that are threats out there understand that there are a lot of different relationships in the Pacific that could prove to be problematic if, if someone chooses to be uh, to get a little out of hand. Very often we hear from our members of Congress, uh, particularly our delegation, commentary on how presidents are do the president is doing. Yes. Uh, what would you have to say uh, by way of advice to the next president of the United States? I, I won't put you on the spot and yes. ask you who it is. <laughs> yeah, no, please don't. Yes. Be, but, yes. but what would you have to say to that president in terms of the kind of leadership that needs to be shown from the Oval Office? That's a great question. I actually firmly believe that in order for the United States to have mm -hmm. the, its place in the national leadership spectrum, we have to make sure that our military is properly resourced to meet the challenges. You'd be a strong advocate for maintaining a strong military. I, I am. Now, that, understand that doesn't mean a blank check for the military. Mm -hmm having been in the military for a long time, I understand how the uh, industrial military complex can just right. get awry. But I do believe that the president has to put uh, his, his importance on a strong military presence. You look across the world and, and you see the United States as it is regarded by our enemies yes. and friends alike. What has happened to the reputation of the United States, and, and, and what do you think you can contribute to the building of our reputation as a member of Congress? Well, I'm always going to say, and I believe it with all my heart, that the United States is the world's best military, mm -hmm. has the world's best military, and, and has that reputation around the world. With that being said, our capability has been degraded over the mm -hmm. last eight years or so. And um, we have a lot to catch up on. We don't have the technological ed we, edge we once had because of lack of investments in those things. And we've just uh, wasted years um, making sure that we kept that edge. Our troops are tired. Our equipment is tired and needs to be refreshed. And, and so there's a lot that I would make sure that... A lot needs to be done. A lot needs to be done, absolutely. But w one of the... In essential ingredients to having a strong military is a strong economy. Yes. Nationally and within our states yes. as well. You have some views about the Hawaii economy, and uh, I, I don't think you are a stranger to something that all of us know. Mm -hmm. Our cost of living is continually rising. Yes. Our, our ability to make a living and keep our children at home 
suffers from, from the brain drain because yes. the opportunities aren't here and so forth. Yes. What are some of the causes that you think you could address from Washington, D.C. Uh, and f in terms of finding solutions for Hawaii's economy? You know, that's a great question. The cost of living is something mm -hmm. that matters to us every day. I'm raising children right. that are teenagers, and we sit around the dinner table and talk about the cost of living in terms of what are we going to spend our next dollar on mm. and how we're, going to, how we're going to get the things we want to get. Um, so it's something that's near and dear to my heart as a mom and as a, a, as a citizen of Hawaii. Now, in, being out here in the middle of the Pacific, the most isolated archipelago yes. in, in, in the world, we're dependent pretty heavily upon importing our food and Absolutely. our supplies for building buildings and steel yes. and conch, everything else involved in that, which makes us very dependent upon the shipping industry. That's you have right. some strong ideas about I some do. reforms Washington I do. have. I do. I, I'm very, very familiar with the shipping industry. I've done transportation my entire life in the military globally. And the Jones Act is, is something that um, adds on unnecessary uh, burden to Hawaii families, as well as Alaska and, and Puerto Rico, but I'm looking at Hawaii families. And, and it's an unnecessary burden uh, for the shipping to support the national security of our country. Um, and it's, it just increases our cost of living exponentially. I think over $3,000 a household. Mm. And I, I know I can do a lot more with $3,000 and paying right. extra for it. Well, what kind of solution do you think you could suggest for this? And, and, and I want to preface that with yes. saying that politically we haven't gone very far yes. with bringing any kind of reforming or updating to the Jones Act. Yes. Because oftentimes voices stand at extreme positions yes. opposed to each other, shouting for keeping it absolutely the same as yes. it's been 100 years or repealing it completely. You have a different view, don't you? I do. You know, the I've been involved with the Jones Act my entire career mm -hmm. as a transportation officer, and I believe that there is room to amend the Jones Act uh, for the 21st century. I do believe that there's uh, some things that we can do so that uh, Hawaii and Alaskan Puerto Rico citizens do not have to play these extreme uh, prices for the price of our national security. Uh, Alaska, in fact, ha has many particular exemptions for certain industries mm -hmm. and so forth. Do you think Hawaii could possibly make use of that kind of legislation? I think Hawaii, with the right leadership at the mm -hmm. helm, can make use of that legislation. Well, Absolutely. It's no secret that our current congressional delegation stands lockstep opposed to any changes whatsoever or updating yes. of the Jones Act. Yes, and that is one thing that differentiates myself from the other voices out there. I believe that there should be an amendment to this, and I do believe that it's time for change and that Hawaii families' voices should be heard and their concerns should be prime on how we represent our folks in Washington, D.C. Before we go to a short break, uh, I'll ask you a quick question. Yes. Uh, if you're elected, you'll be working with three colleagues, probably who are Democrats. Yes. How do you anticipate your teamwork? You know, I've spent decades working with mm. people from different walks of life, different political views, different countries. I have no problem. I have no doubt that I can do a great job um, as my past has, uh, as my past can show you on how to get the mission done. And for me, this is a mission. Well, we'll be right back after a short break. And, and uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about the kind of impact that Washington, D.C. has on Hawaii uh, in terms of the ability to run a business or to Great. make a livelihood. I'm Great. talking with Shirlene Ostrov, retired colonel from the United States Air Force, a business leader here in the state of Hawaii who's thrown her hat into the rink to be the Republican contender for the congressional district number one seat. We'll be back with her in just a moment. Don't go away. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program Law Across the Sea on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I represent the Puna and Ka'u District on the Big Island and the host of Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can join us at thinktechhawaii.com. You can find a link there to, uh, to a page where you can see past episodes. And we talk here about good government, environmental issues, and issues of the day facing the state of Hawaii. 
I'm Russell Ruderman. Please join us for the Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo. Welcome back to the final segment of today's Ehana Kako. Every week we're here on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, and I'd like to tip my hat to Jay Fidel and all the great crew who make it happen here. They produce about 35 hours of original content from downtown Honolulu that goes across the world, is broadcast multiple times on broadcast stations here, and seen on the internet uh, forever, really. And you can find that content on all kinds of issues, such as the economy, government, society, uh, the culture and the arts, at thinktechhawaii.com. By the way, uh, as you may know if you watch regularly, uh, we call ourselves Ehana Kako. Because at the Grassroot Institute, we like to mimic, if you will, a venerable old Hawaiian saying, e pule kako. If you're in Hawaii, you'll hear e pule kako all the time. That means let's pray together. E hana kako means let's work together. Because think of the terrible alternative. If we don't work together, we'll get nothing done. But uh, if we work together, nothing can stop us. And, that, and that's what we need. That's part of the spirit that Shirlene Ostroff would take to Washington, D.C. in terms of bringing people from disparate backgrounds together to work, whether they're Republican and Democrat or from any other kinds of backgrounds. And so I'm going to dive right back into our conversation. Shirlene, people don't like Washington, D.C. very much. No, they don't. <laughs> but it, there's, it's a kind of a love-hate relationship <coughs> because here in Hawaii, we seem to always turn to Washington, D.C. to get more funding for things. Yes. And at the same time, we're not fully aware of the extent to which Washington, D.C. interferes with our freedoms and our lives and our businesses here. But you've been looking at that for quite a while. I have. I actually have had uh, three assignments in Washington, D.C., so I, I uh -huh. consider that a way as my second home. Um, oh, I don't know if you want to let yeah, that out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I, I do understand that uh, the power in Washington, D.C., when wielded properly, can really be a help to the folks back home. And so that's why I that's why I put my hat in the race. I understand what Washington, D.C. can bring to the people of Hawaii if, with the right leadership. Well, and that's so very important. But unfortunately, Hawaii is strapped in many ways by policies that Washington, D.C. initiates, yes. affecting our taxes, affecting yes. small business. Uh, you, you and I were talking a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the taxes can definitely be uh, something to address, you know, simplifying the taxes, the tax code would be uh, great in order for people to stimulate their own economy, to to open their businesses or you know provide provide jobs, expand their businesses, th those kinds of things. I think that um, there's opportunities there to to really make a difference for the That's folks right. back home. That's right. I appreciate some of your comments you, you gave me uh, last week mm -hmm. uh, regarding a grassroots institute newsletter that we sent out, yes. in which we pointed out how complex. The tax is. situation is and it how is. hard it is for us here in Hawaii. It is. You know, we, I, I lament uh, we, when we just went through this past tax season. I remember when I was uh, just coming out and working, I could fill out a 1040 EZ and, you know, comply with the uh, federal law. And now it's a, it's a complicated process that only the experts can understand, I, even for someone as simple as, as myself. That's right. Uh, here in Hawaii, how are small businesses faring un under laws relating to uh, medical insurance or uh, minimum wage and, and, and or other federal regulations you know I think that uh, I think the small businesses here are challenged mm -hmm. quite frankly by the weight of the regulations from Washington DC and that's the voice that needs to be brought to Washington DC right that people in Hawaii uh, and and everywhere would like to see uh, a simpler uh, taxes and uh, simpler regulations that would allow them to make That's some right. decisions and start their own businesses and, and be great uh, parts of their society wherever they're from, but especially here in Hawaii. I know you have a special heart for the individuals who are working in the fishing industry here in Hawaii. Absolutely. And, and recently you stood with some of our, our well-known political leaders, Governor yes. Ariyoshi, Governor Senator Akaka, yes. Senator Akaka. You want to tell us a little bit about that? You know, I just, I just uh, believe that 
those uh, those leaders in particular have served Hawaii well for many years, and they understand the needs of Hawaii. Well, they came out recently with a, a letter in, in, in yes. which they uh, opposed an action of President Obama to expand the National Marine Monument known as Papahanao Mokuakea. Yes. It's a complex issue, though. It the, is complex. It's, it's mixed with It is complex. Bad. You know, I... I um, I care about the uh, fishing rights of the mm -hmm. Native Hawaiians, but I care about the fishing rights of the industry here. That's it's right. a very important industry here in Hawaii. Um, and the science, you know, there, there's a lot of things that go in it. Like you said, it's complex. We could talk about the science behind it for a long time, but I do stand behind Senator Kaka, Governors uh, Kaitan and Ariyoshi, because they understand the issue. They understand the complexity of the issue, and it's not just a simple sure. uh, yes or no. So. And, and what are your thoughts about the expansion of federal power? That, that's a massive expansion that's of right. federal Unto power into our backyard. That's exactly right. I don't know that... Uh, I, there's a place for that here in Hawaii, especially in this particular issue. Um, it, it's something that it's something that I believe in. Smaller government, the smaller government reach, mm -hmm. definitely the federal government reach into things like the Hawaiian fishing rights is is I think a, a stretch too far. Well, this is a highly politicized issue, so it's a good touching. Uh, it's a good kicking off point yes. for me to ask you this next question. Yes. As you work with people from different political backgrounds and points of view, uh, what do you bring to the table? It, it, you, you're working in a state, Hawaii, that is largely Democrat, yes. uh, empowered by the unions. The, the other members of your congressional delegation, should you win, will be Democrats. And yet you ha have alluded to earlier that you have the ability to work with the Republicans. How do you yes. envision your role being able to span these two different points of view. Now, that's a good question. You know, I think one thing that works for me in this situation is that I spent an entire uh, several decades um, working in different environments and with different political parties and with different people with different interests. And so I understand that in order to make uh, something work that you have to be able to negotiate right. different points of views. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, I think that experience will come to bear very well in this situation. I think in the military, you've learned quite a few lessons about yes. leadership. What, what lessons do you bring to bear upon becoming a, a congresswoman? Well, I, I believe in the core values that I've been mm -hmm. brought up with. Uh, integrity first, mm -hmm. service before self. Service before self. That's clearly, and then excellence in all we do. I, those three core values is what I, I bring to the table, and I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to bring that to the table of a, con you know, a congressional position if, if, I, if I win. One of the things we've observed in the presidential primaries and in a few other races here in Hawaii mm -hmm. is that people are no longer necessarily voting along party lines. Yes. It seems that particular candidates, the issues that they stand for, are taking a more prominent place in the minds and actions of the voting public. Yes. So people are going to make choices. So th th what I've respected is you've spoken w with respect uh, about the competition, about, yes. about uh, 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 Colleen Hanabusa. Yes. And yet you differentiate yourself from her. Very it, much so. It, it, what, what are some of those markers of dis differentiation? You know, one of the major markers is that I'm not a career politician. Mm -hmm. And so my my agenda is is pretty clear. I want to represent the people of Hawaii. The, as as you know, as you can imagine, uh, running in a federal race is not an easy task, and it's not for the faint of heart. And and I'm doing this because I really believe that Hawaii does deserve someone who is bringing a, a a whole different experience set to the table, different points of views. Um, I've worked in many different administrations there in Washington D.C., so I understand how that can be done and how to navigate the system pretty well. Well, one of the th things that is often asked of politicians, and unfairly so, I think, who are mm -hmm. female, mm -hmm. is the quote-unquote woman's question. Uh-oh. <laughs> what do you bring to the table? Yes, or, exactly. Uh, what would you do for women? And, and while I think that the premise of that question uh, is questionable itself, yes. it's something that you probably have to address all the time. It is. It is. You know, as as you can imagine, you know, I, I came in the military 25 plus years ago. So you've had tremendous experience in, in climbing in, the ladder. In climbing and the ladder the and, and doing it within the system too. and doing it earnestly mm -hmm. and sincerely. And um, I'd stand on the shoulders of many women who came before me. And I think that um, 
I, I don't even think it's a question anymore. I think that there's a place for us, and I, f I feel and I know that I can bring that leadership skill to Well, you've, to already, you've already spoken of your, your belief in a strong military. Yes. A and at the same time, the military is probably one of the most egalitarian societies yes. that exists, yes. giving opportunity to everyone based upon their character and based upon their competence. Yes. How would you bring that kind of model to society itself? You know, I believe not only in the government uh, structure, but I believe in civil society, and those kinds of things are important in civil society. We don't, in, in civil society organizations, we don't necessarily uh, rely on a formal rank structure mm -hmm. uh, for value. And, and so I've been involved in, in many things like a halal in Washington, uh -huh. D.C., um, some uh, other organizations here in Hawaii, um, Crime Stoppers and things like that, to be part of the civil society that helps. And it doesn't matter what rank you are, right? Those kinds of egalitarian uh, ideas are key in just making it work. Well, you've let our viewership know a little bit about your positions, your yes. stands, and so forth. And while usually at the front end, people talk about their personal life. Yes. I wanted to save to the end just oh, this question of, uh, yes. a bit about your ties to Hawaii. You mentioned that you are in a halal, a hula yes. halal in Washington, D.C. Yes. So I, um, I was born and raised here. So um, when, I, when I went to college at the University of Florida, I knew I was going to come back. Mm -hmm. 25 plus years later, I'm back. Um, married my husband uh, 26 years ago. Um, and we've traveled all around the world. And Hawaii has always been home. This has been our roots. Um, when I was in Washington, D.C., I was fortunate enough to help co-found with four others, uh, Hula Halau, that's now the oh, largest. Wonderful. Yeah, that's not the largest there in that area. And we teach culture of Hawaii, and, and we're proud of what we do because that's who we are. You've been a long-term ambassador for Hawaii. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, as we look to the future, um, in some ways, it's dim for our children here in Hawaii when it comes to whether they can own a home, wh whether they can find a, a meaningful living here in this economy, whether they will have the freedoms that generations before have fought and died for. A and yet, uh, I think you may be a little more optimistic. What, what is your vision of the future that we can craft together? You know, I am very optimistic. When I first started uh, in adulthood, um, we had just finished Desert Storm. So mm -hmm. the world was tumultuous. And, right. and I remember being in college when the wall came down. So I've only known this change, uh, this constant change in the world. And, and I, I think I, I thrive on it. And that optimism mm -hmm. um, coupled with hard work, hard work and the belief that you can do it and really putting yourself out there. And that's what, that's what this is, putting myself out there to be part of the solution. Well, Shirlene Ostrov, thank you for putting thank yourself you so out much. there. And Thanks so much for having me on the show. A lot of people are going to be watching. Thank you. Shirlene Ostrov, running for the United States Congress from Hawaii. You can look her up if I turn back to her for a moment here yes. at her website. What yes, it's www.shirleneostrov.com. Very good. Thank, Thank you for you. watching again. I'm Keili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, saying ehana kako. Let's work together from the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next week, aloha.